Council meeting minutes for March 12, 2013. Do any members of the Village Council have any questions, comments, changes, or concerns with respect to those minutes? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Those minutes are adopted. Thank you very much. That brings us to item four on our agenda, which is that promised section where we entertain comments of a general nature with respect to items not appearing on tonight's agenda. So if there's anyone in the audience that has a comment or a question, and I see Mr. Kassif from our Economic Development Corporation is here tonight. And while he's getting set up, I will invite everyone else to think if you have any questions or comments of a general nature with respect to items not appearing on our agenda tonight. The uh, protocol is to approach the podium, much as Mr. Cass is demonstrating right now. <laughs> Give us, our, give us your name and address, and we would welcome hearing from you. So our first speaker under this section is Mr. Kassa. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, commissioners. Thank you. Uh, Michael Kassa, president of the Downers Grove Economic Development Corporation at 2001 Butterfield Road, Suite 120 in Downers Grove. Um, come to you today, to tonight, to uh, do a recap of 2012. And um, I'll be back again for a formal presentation in August, which will kind of be a, a mid-year report. I had intended to present this on uh, March 5th, but the weather didn't cooperate. And so uh, uh, to the mayor and to Dave Fieldman and to Commissioner Durkin, who've already seen this presentation at our full board meeting, uh, you get to see it a second time. Um, uh, let me just uh, uh, sort of take a, uh, a quick recap of 2012 start with some marketing initiatives. I want to mention uh, five uh, on the economic development side. The first is that uh, we continue to advertise Downers Grove as a business location. You have in front of you uh, an you. ad that we have run in the uh, state of Illinois' economic development guide. Um, that's going to come out in about two weeks. <coughs> and we are in the um, office section, the Fortune 500 section of the guide. Uh, we purchased a full page ad and the ad you're looking at um, promotes Downers Grove as a location for corporate headquarters and other major office projects. <coughs> we also participate in a lot of trade shows. In a few weeks I'll be participating in the biotech show down in Chicago, uh, an, important, an important show um, for a, um, an industry that um, the um, state of Illinois and this region have made great strides in. And of course, you oftentimes hear me talk about the International Council of Shopping Centers show. Each year we participate in the main show, which is held in uh, Clark County, Nevada uh, in May. Um, we're part of the DuPage County booth. And uh, we participate in the deal-making show in Chicago in October. Another marketing item I'd like to mention is that we're taking, uh, making uh, a greater effort to attract foreign um, direct investment into Downers Grove, foreign-owned firms. I'm currently uh, uh, co-chairing a statewide effort to help develop uh, strategies to attract more foreign-owned firms to, uh, to the state and hopefully to Downers Grove. <coughs> and finally, we awarded a contract to the Macklin Group to develop a new website for the EDC and for the Visitors Bureau. That work has already begun, and we will expect to roll that website, those new websites out in, uh, in June. Let me talk about some economic development projects from last year. Um, start off, you probably cannot read that press release. Uh, the year got off to a great start when we, we um, uh, had the distinction of being a community with the largest uh, lease transaction and the third largest lease transaction in the entire Chicago area. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, was one of the largest transactions the, for the entire year and was the largest of that quarter. Um, they uh, expanded their 173,000 square foot uh, lease space at uh, Highland Landmark. The other one was Hobby Global Solutions, which moved from Highland Landmark into 3,500 Lacey, but they doubled their capacity to 140,000 square feet, and they are now in the process of uh, uh, doing their remodeling. Uh, uh, and I'm sort of go going through this as, they, uh, as these projects occur during the year. Uh, in spring, this council approved an incentive agreement with Bentley Downers Grove, which brought the uh, sale of luxury cars uh, to Ogden Avenue. Newco, one of the, the fixtures in our community celebrated 
the grand opening of their, of their latest expansion project, a major expansion to their headquarters um, facility uh, at the Ellsworth Business Park. Five Guys Burger and Fries opened their new restaurant in a, in a uh, multi-tenant building at Ogden and Fairview. The council approved a revised incentive agreement with the Lemon Tree Grocer, which um, uh, help, helps uh, them sustain them here in Downers Grove, <coughs> excuse me, and in our downtown. State Farm, one of the year's, I think, best projects. State Farm closed four regional locations and opened their West uh, um, Operations Center in Downers Grove uh, in the um, uh, Opus West uh, Office Park with 600 employees as the second largest State Farm facility in the state of Illinois. Mr. Submarine took a um, closed KFC location on Ogden and opened last year a, a new restaurant and that was uh, one of the Oasis projects for 2012. ASGE, the um, uh, American Society of Gastro, I, I'm not sure I can pro pronounce the rest of it. Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you, um, I always get that wrong. Uh, broke ground on April 27th of their new, corp of new uh, training facility and corporate headquarters at Esplanade, a 50,000 square foot building, and that project is nearing completion. Painters USA in May um, opened a 10,000 square foot <coughs> facility, their second location, uh, in the Oak Grove Business Park um, uh, north of Butterfield. Flavor Chem, which actually uh, we uh, announced publicly their uh, uh, expansion by building a new liquid production facility at their corporate headquarters in Oak Grove Business Park, north of Butterfield, uh, an eight and a half million dollar investment. And there you see um, the um, president of the company uh, cutting the ribbon with one of the relatives of the uh, uh, company founder. <coughs> Chase opened a new branch at uh, 63rd in Maine. PGA Tour uh, Superstore uh, had a grand opening in June, and it was the best uh, one day and first week that chain has ever had of any store in their, uh, of all the stores in the United States. They're doing very well, and that's, actually I love that picture. It was taken um, uh, from, from higher above, and um, you see the, the mayor cutting the ribbon on that, uh, that new facility. Best Buy. Uh, we were worried that this was going to be a loss. They were going to move to another community and happy to report that last summer, early last summer, they signed a 10-year lease extension to stay in Downers Grove and there's going to be some improvements made to that, uh, to that facility. Shop and Save. As you know, uh, the main grocery anchor location at Downers Park Plaza has been vacant for uh, over a year and a half when Michael's closed. Um, last summer, we announced that Shop and Save, which is a, now an eight-store chain, will be going into that, uh, into that uh, anchor uh, space. And just in the last couple of weeks, myself, Dave Fieldman, and Tom Daybreiner met with the uh, ownership of the company to talk about the, uh, the grand opening, which will be in a matter of weeks. Invesco Power Shares closed two regional locations and moved their main Chicago area office to Downers Grove at 3500 Lacey. Uh, just as Hobby is now doing, they are now doing the, uh, the uh, remodeling for nearly 100,000 square feet of space in that building. Packy West, <coughs> in August, this council approved a revised uh, uh, sales tax agreement with Packy Webb that called for them to make uh, some additional public improvements, which they've now completed. Aston Martin, this announcement got a lot of buzz. Uh, Aston Martin uh, uh, moved into the uh, former Saab dealership on Ogden. In January, they had a soft opening for the uh, dealership, and they are planning a big grand opening this spring when all the improvements uh, are completed to the facility. Grunfuss USA, not a household name, but uh, they're one, one of the world's leader, leaders in the um, uh, water pump industry based in Denmark. And their North American headquarters had been in Kansas. They had, we announced uh, in the fall they'd be moving their North American headquarters to Downers Grove in, uh, in Esplanade. And just last week, the mayor and I did a conference call with their CEO. And on 
uh, April 16th of this year at 10 a.m. They're going to do, um, we have a quick, not sure what it's called. It's not a grand opening. It's not a groundbreaking. They're going to begin the it's floor breaking, floor breaking, the <laughs> modeling of their uh, the 17th floor in that building. And so everyone will be receiving an invitation from the company. We uh, hope you come out to that. Poogie, uh, which has three dealerships on Ogden, completed last fall the uh, VW dealership uh, work that they were doing, <clears throat> and they now have three operational dealers uh, dealerships on Ogden. And Midwestern University, um, the uh, uh, sort of a, for, from an economic developer's perspective, it's the gift that keeps on giving. In 2012, they completed their basic science building and the parking deck on their main campus, began construction on the dental clinic and the parking deck on their Esplanade campus, which will be completed very soon, and they broke ground on a 2,500 square foot auditorium. Um, they've just made a tremendous investment in, and continue to make that investment in Downers Grove. Uh, I'm meeting with Dr. Geppinger tomorrow morning uh, to go over some, uh, some economic development issues, and I'm certainly gonna thank her and her team for their continued uh, uh, investment in, in our community. I think I, that screen is, that slide is empty. That's of course the Visitors Bureau is supposed to be. Uh, let me just mention a few Visitors Bureau notes from last year. We formed the Downers Grove Visitors Bureau Committee, which includes stakeholders, including the village, the park district, um, downtown management, the hotels, um, several, the Tivoli, several other stakeholders, all of whom um, uh, work with us for the attraction of visitors uh, to our community. We unveiled the uh, Android version of our mobile app, and we continue to place advertising in state, regional, and uh, county publications. All the major tourism guides have an ad from Downers Grove, as well as other uh, uh, publications that, are, um, uh, that, are, that feature stories such as uh, one that West Suburban Living did, a full feature on our community last fall. And as I mentioned earlier, We've contracted with the Macklin Group to develop a new website also for the Visitors Bureau. And those two new websites will be uh, <coughs> launched, unveiled, at the first annual uh, Downers Grove Economic Development Corporation annual luncheon, which will be held on June 26th at <coughs> the Double Tree. And you will all receive an invitation. I hope you mark your calendars for that event. The last slide I wanted to mention were the sales tax revenues for 2012. Um, and you can see a four-year uh, list of the past four years. And there was a slight increase in 2012 over 2011 of 3.8%. Um, I want to mention that we have a new chairman of our board. If you haven't met him, I uh, hope you get a chance to do so. His name is Scott Miller. He's managing director of Jones Lang LaSalle and is a tr tremendous guy, and um, he is serving in that capacity in a leadership role. Um, and someone else you may know, uh, Mike Carina, a senior executive at DeVry, serves as our new vice chairman. But also on our board of directors and on our executive committee, of course, are the mayor, Sean Durkin, the council liaison, Dave Fieldman, and Mike Baker. So you're very uh, well represented on both our board of directors and our uh, executive committee. I guess I just want to close for answer any questions just to say thank you to the council. Um, it's easy for me to go out and tell businesses uh, that we have a very business friendly climate here in Downers Grove and that's due in no small measure to the, uh, to the policies that you have set. Uh, this is a very pro-business community. We welcome business <coughs> webinars. And of course, the nuts and bolts, those deals don't get done without the tremendous support that I received from your professional staff. So to the council and the staff, I want to say thank you. You helped make, make it possible for me to stand up and share good news. Having said that, I'll be happy to answer the questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Cass. We appreciate the uh, periodic updates, and we appreciate all the, uh, the good news that comes with it. And you're right, it's only due to a lot of hard work and perseverance and diligence by a, a lot of different people, both in the public and private sector. Questions are comments from the council or Mr. Kassler, Commissioner Schnell? Just, just one question. In, when you're talking to prospective businesses, is there anything that we're not doing that we should be doing to help attract them? I mean, has anyone said, you know, if you could only do X, we'd come or? 
Well, that way it's a hard question. Um, Sorry. That's okay. Um, well, I, let, me guess, let me guess answer this way. I guess from a business's perspective, you can always do more. You know, but when we compare Downers Grove to our competitors in the region, um, to our competitors in the state, um, we are viewed very, very favorably. Um, when I was interviewing for this job, I, I view interviews as a two-way street. I went and talked to developers and brokers and corporate real estate managers and said, because I didn't know a lot about Downers Grove before coming here. What have you heard? What has been your experience been? Boy, the news was just so good. In fact, it was almost too good to be true. Um, so yes, while you can always make improvements, um, I'm very, very happy with our business climate here. Um, one of the things that you allow me to do, that the staff allows me to do, is to get my, provide my input. Um, and we may not always agree, and that's okay too, but the business community knows they have a seat at the table. And that is probably the best thing that we can do, that their voice is heard, even if we don't necessarily agree with them um, on every occasion. They know that, that their voice is heard <coughs> in a legitimate way. Um, and so again, um, you can always do better, but I think we've established a pretty good business climate here and a good track record. Thanks. So. Other questions or comments? I'll just add, Mr. Casa, that uh, the Best Buy example that you described in your presentation I think is worth highlighting because we often speak of attracting new businesses to Downers Grove and as your presentation this, this time and in the past demonstrates we've been very successful in doing that and obviously we have to have an environment that is favorable in that respect. Uh, but I don't want to underestimate the importance of the retention aspect of what you do. It's not just attraction, it's also retention. There's an old saying of, about uh, you, you ought to spend more time with the customers you have than the customers you want to have because if you lose what you have, you're in a world of hurt. Uh, so I just want to, again, applaud those efforts as well. Keeping businesses here uh, that contribute mightily to our economic environment is, is as important, if not more important, than attracting new ones. So thank you for, for highlighting an example of that as well. Very good. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Look forward to uh, next time. Thank you. And if anyone forgot, we're still on item four of our agenda. <laughs> Comments of a general nature with respect to matters not appearing on tonight's agenda. So if there are any other members of the audience who would like to ask any questions or make any comments of a general nature, now would be the time. Hearing none, we will move along to item five, public hearings. We have no public hearings tonight, so we will go directly to item six, our consent agenda. We have six items on our consent agenda tonight. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Are there any questions or comments from any members of our audience with respect to any of the items on the consent agenda? Any questions or comments from any members of the Village Council with respect to the items on the consent agenda? Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Schnell? Aye. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Commissioner Rinkin? Aye. Commissioner Burnett? Aye. Commissioner Newstead? Aye. Commissioner Waldeck? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. The consent agenda <coughs> passes 7-0. That brings us to item seven, our active agenda. We have one item on our active, active agenda tonight. Do I have a motion to approve the labor agreement with the Illinois Fraternal Order of Police Labor Council, VOC operators, as presented? I may tell you I move to approve the labor agreement with the Illinois Fraternal Order of Police Labor Council, VOC operators, and to authorize the mayor and the village clerk to sign the agreement on behalf of the village and to take the steps necessary to implement the terms thereof. Second. Are there any questions or comments from any members of the audience with respect to this item? Questions or comments from members of the Village Council? Commissioner Newstadt. Thank you, Mayor. This is another outstanding example of our management team and the employee group working together to come to a uh, mutually agreed upon agreement. The terms of this agreement are, are the same as our other labor agreements that we've just recently discussed. As I said last week, when we can have management rights and employee rights, everybody wins. Uh, I think this is a, an appropriate and a reasonable um, labor agreement and I will be in full support of it and I thank all the parties involved. This was a very quick uh, negotiation timing. I mean January to March was pretty fast so uh, I appreciate the speed that this contract took and uh, look forward to it being ratified. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions or comments from members of the Council? Commissioner Barnett. Thank you Mayor. I won't uh, belabor my colleagues with the repetitive nature of comments from the past meetings. I have a question though um, that I'd like to have answered you know, kind of in an official manner. Um, we've had a couple of contracts over the last, uh, I guess, two and a half years here now, and it's been 
you know, various uh, terminology has been used from boxes to constraints to raindrops, et cetera. Um, and I, I guess I'd like to know, you know, some sort of official clarification that doesn't use that kind of terminology about whether or not there's anything in the basis of any of the laws that constrain us from not negotiating on any particular set of topics. Um, that is a, uh, a bit of a point that I need clarification on because my understanding I don't think matches necessarily my colleagues. There are no legal parameters that prohibit us from negotiating on any particular item. There are legal frameworks uh, within which we have to work that lessen the likelihood of breaking new ground in certain areas that we've talked about before. But there's certainly no laws prohibiting either reaching an agreement or negotiating on those items. So just to be clear, choosing to pr pursue one groundbreaking idea or not is a opinion that we've, nego we've developed collectively that's based on what we think are possible successes, not in particular prohibitions in process or legislation. That is correct. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I'll take it. Commissioner Waldeck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's probably the last uh, chance I'll have to comment on union contracts uh, uh, bef before I leave here. And the last one I'll be involved in. And I've avoided making many of the remarks uh, uh, about the various contracts. But this contract is the ones that preceded it have resulted in comments by others that I really think I need to comment on. Uh, comments have been made about bemoaning the process. The contract, like the others, are the result of a union team and of negotiators meeting with the management team and coming to agreement with both sides believe is fair. Each side takes the result back and gets, tries to get approval. There are rules, but these are the results of thousands of other negotiations around the country in the state. And while not perfect, both sides are subject to the same framework and rules. In some cases, but not in this contract, the employees give up the right to strike and are instead subject to arbitration. The arbitration process is much like the publicized sequestration the way I see it. It's not necessarily a good outcome and is meant to promote both parties coming to an agreement. It's part of the process and can loom as an incentive to come to an agreement. In this contract, the management team and the union negotiators came to a result. The union membership has accepted it, and now it's our turn. Let's look at the proposal and not try to blame some process. The process has affected both parties, and I think the result is a good and fair, fair one. And over the last few contracts, including this one, there's been some supposedly grand idea that would protect the village and possibly offer greater rewards to employees. Such an idea does sound indeed laudable, but it, on its face, it is. But I would feel, I feel it's disastrous to any process and it would create problems. First, my experience on both sides of the union management process tells me that the first duty of any good union agreement is the safety and security of its members. <clears throat> Un <clears throat> excuse me. Unions are not about to gamble or, or gamble on basic concepts and fundamentals. Security and predictability are key provisions. Village management also benefits from security and predictability. Council often praises our long-range financial plan. Management can reasonably project costs that allows for good working relationships without having to constantly <coughs> revisit terms. Since I took office, we have had some good budgetary results, which allowed us to either provide more services or pass along the lower, by lowering taxes. We've also seen some tough times. At such times, having a good relationship with employees may allow both sides to reach agree agreements to help resolve issues. If either side fails to cooperate in tough times, the contract will come up again, and both sides know what they're dealing with. We will be able to afford this contract, and if the village hits tough times again, choices will be made, but they are choices. On the other hand, if a contract is based on budgetary targets, both sides are asking for trouble. If the village budget's wrong, it may cost the village. We're almost four months into our new year, and there is a likelihood that we will be adjusting our 2012 budget. Let me repeat, our 2012 budget. When, a, when is a windfall a windfall? The $300,000 we use to reduce taxes might be subject to negotiation. Large needed expenditures could be the basis of contention as to whether or not it should have been spent. 
village funding is always part of a competing interests decisions and such decisions may put unions in direct conflict with the residents time and time again, which might also create legal battles if not, if not a dissatisfied workplace. So this contract, thankfully, has no such poison pills. If we negotiated, uh, it was negotiated by the parties, and I believe it's a fair result, and I plan on supporting it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions or comments from the Council? I hadn't planned on saying anything, but uh, given the discussion that preceded this, I just want to point a couple things out, because the question was asked, are there any parameters that uh, govern our ability to think outside of the box? The answer is absolutely not. We can think of any way we want. We could figure out, we could do our collective bargaining by <clears throat> throwing a bunch of numbers down a flight of stairs, and whatever hit the bottom would be the outcome. And I'm, I'm using hyperbole to illustrate the point. No, there's no limit on that. Um, but the problem is, what happens when the other side doesn't agree? That's really the issue. I can, we can propose anything, the other side can propose anything. There's no limit on the creativity of a proposal. If both sides are willing to agree and pursue a proposal, no matter how creative it is, then you're likely going to have some kind of a creative outcome. That's great, but what happens when one side doesn't agree to pursue that path? Can you force them to? That is really the question. And there, there is a box that is well defined. There's two things that one has to keep in mind. One, the rules, and number two, precedent. This is no different than the analysis that people go through when they decide whether to settle litigation. There are certain rules that one must follow when engaged in a dispute, and there's precedent. Precedent is what has gone before. And one looks at the rules and reaches a certain conclusion as to the likelihood of success, that is, getting my way as opposed to the other guy's way. And one also looks at precedent because precedent is not always an indicator of future performance, sort of like the securities industry, uh, but it's something that one must be mindful of in order to make a responsible and um, risk-tolerant decision. Um, of course, there are costs that go along with these things. Uh, so the rules are very simple. Uh, it's uh, uh, Section 5, ILCS 315. It's called the Illinois Public, Rela Public Relations Act, which, among other things, the purpose of which is to regulate labor relations between public employers and employees, including the designation of employee representatives, negotiation of wages, hours, and other conditions of employment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and resolution of disputes arising under collective bargaining agreements. So there are rules, and those are known to everyone. My point has always been, we don't make those rules. The Illinois General Assembly does. Um, if we could change those rules, hallelujah, would be happy to. Can't do it. Um, now. Do I support efforts to change those rules to allow for more freedom and more creativity and perhaps requiring, if not mandating, more acceptance of new ways of looking at things? Absolutely. But that is a battle that must be fought and won in Springfield. I'll say it again. That's a battle that must be fought and won in Springfield. Do we push for those kind of things? You betcha. But ultimately, that's where that change needs to be made. The other thing, as I mentioned, is, is precedent. One does not go forward and do a negotiation or a resolution of dispute oblivious to what has gone before. Outcomes of prior dispute resolutions are in this context, um, it's called arbitration. Those are known to both sides. And one can look at those pre that, that precedent and make some reasonable decisions about the likelihood of success if one <coughs> to insist upon their position above and beyond all others. And yes, you can pursue that, but you also have a pretty good idea of what the cost is going to be of pursuing that, what the risk is that you will be unsuccessful, and what the cost and risk will be that uh, not only will you not get the outcome that you want, but there may be other related impacts upon the organization and the overall uh, environment in which one operates. And then it becomes an issue of, like it does in any other dispute resolution, you have to figure out and balance the amount of risk you're going to accept. You have to balance and accept the amount of cost that it's going to take you to get there. And this is something that hopefully is in a normal dispute resolution environment equal on both sides. I'll go back to that box. In my opinion, the box does not allow for that same risk and cost to be equal enough to allow for pursuit of some different outcomes that perhaps might be more creative and more um, outside of the norm than is currently the case. That's where the rules, I think, are an impediment to more creativity than perhaps uh, many are willing to accept. But at the end of the day, it's all about balancing risks and about balancing cost and trying to be fair to the organization, fair to the taxpayers, and fair to those who are actually providing the services. And as I've said before, uh, the contracts that we've approved in the past 
uh, albeit by a split vote, are ones I think ultimately were appropriately achieved and resulted in a fair outcome given the parameters within one which one must operate and the precedent that is fully aware and available to both sides. And I think and the ultimately have been for the best interests of this organization, for those that serve it, and for those who receive the benefits of it. So I will be in, in favor of this agreement as well. And just for clarification, since the, the motion referenced the uh, Illinois Fraternal Order of Police, this is not the police contract that we spoke about last week. This is a different one that deals with our village operation center or our dispatch center. So it's not the one that we talked about last week. This is actually a different uh, collective bargaining agreement that we're voting on tonight. So with that, I'll ask for a roll call, please. Commissioner Schnell. Aye. Commissioner Newstead. Aye. Commissioner Rankin. Aye. Commissioner Barnett. Nay. Commissioner Durkin. Nay. Commissioner Waldeck. Aye. Mayor Tully. Aye. The matter passes 5-2. That brings us to item eight on our agenda, which is our first reading. We have two items on our first reading tonight, and it is customary for these items to be presented by village staff. So I will turn this matter over for presentation, which may yet be turned over to someone else um, by village manager David Fieldman. Thank you, Mayor Tully. The first item on tonight's uh, first reading agenda is further consideration and discussion about the Ogden Avenue site improvement strategy, also known as OASIS. And Tom Dabereiner, our Community Development Director, is here to present this item. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. That's what, we have a new button here. I wasn't so sure it was going to work for me. Uh, I am here to talk about the um, Ogden Avenue Site Improvement Strategy, uh, also known as OASIS, and some proposed program modifications that uh, stemmed from discussions we had a, a couple of months ago. Uh, just for background again, in 2010, uh, the OASIS program was developed as a joint effort between uh, Downers Grove EDC and the Chamber, uh, of course with council approval and uh, using TIF funds. Um, one of the key components of this was the development of the OASIS team, which is a committee that does all of the review and the recommendations. Uh, this is made up of representatives from the EDC, the Chamber and then business owners, property owners um, uh, in the community, especially along Ogden. Uh, but um, obviously many of these items come to uh, all of you for a vote uh, and again uh, to use TIF funds. Staff is involved. Staff does provide support to the OASIS team through um, review of applications and then summary of those um, uh, applications for their consideration. Um, originally, um, and really to this day, uh, their recommendations are based on these criteria which were set forth in 2005 from the Ogden Avenue Corridor Improvement Strategies. Um, and uh, again, as a reminder, uh, the goals were to provide more attractive sites, improve traffic circulation for both vehicles and pedestrians, improve uh, building appearance and improve signage and uh, reduce visual clutter. Um, there were various standards that have been uh, employed over time in the last couple of years, really, to review these grant applications. Um, but again, on January 15th, the Village Council asked for several modifications, and uh, these were the five categories. And one was to review the match amount, one was to reduce the maximum grant amount. Uh, the, the match ratio was the first item, the maximum, maximum grant amount was the second. Uh, uh, look at mandating sidewalk construction, not just donations of land, and then uh, review the landscaping requirement, and then consider restrictions on funding franchise requirements. I'd like to take a couple minutes and run through each of these and the recommendations that came from the OASIS team. Uh, first of all, the uh, match ratio. Uh, currently, the ratio is a 75% grant, 25% uh, business participation. Uh, the 75% grant would be uh, reduced to a 75% front yard grant, uh, and the goal there was to encourage some of the more highly visible improvements. That was uh, part of the message that we're, uh, we thought we were hearing on, um, in January. But we also wanted to maintain some funding for the side and rear yards of the, uh, for the applicants, and uh, we were going with a 50% match there through the OASIS team. How would this uh, play out? Well, we've, we've drawn a little house here that's about to grow for you. 
Look, uh, there's a building. The front yard, uh, looking to the top of the screen is the street. The front yard would uh, be drawn uh, approximately at the front of the building itself. And then, of course, the side and the rear are shown on the, to, to either side and then to the, towards the bottom of the screen there. That's uh, generally how that would lay out. The second item was uh, the maximum amount of the grant. The grant had been increased uh, last year to $150,000 for larger lots, those that are greater than one acre, and corner lots because they had more frontage. And then um, uh, the second uh, increase was for smaller lots with the maximum grant of $100,000. Uh, this would return this to the, uh, uh, based on the OASIS team recommendation, this would return to $75,000 and $50,000 uh, respectively. Those are the original amounts um, uh, when the program started. Third item was sidewalks. Uh, in the past, uh, it was okay to provide uh, the land, donate the land, or pr provide an easement for sidewalks. The OASIS, a, the OASIS team agreed to uh, require construction of the sidewalk uh, here. Because the sidewalks are in the front yard, so to speak, we go back to that other chart, um, um, we would be looking at funding at 75% uh, of the grant, um, in part because there is significant public value to having a sidewalk. Um, uh, leading to and away from the uh, property in question. Uh, also, the fourth item was landscaping. Uh, there was some question about potentially increasing this. Um, the uh, requirement, the zoning code requirement is for 10% of lot coverage right now. Um, we were looking at a minimum amount, we being the Oasis team, we were looking at a minimum of, uh, of, of uh, increase to 110% of that 10% uh, coverage. Uh, that actually is fairly significant when you start to look at it for a typical lot along Ogden Avenue that's, that's about 15,000 square feet. That 1% going from 10% to 11% accounts for about one parking space. So if you think about 1% um, taking away a parking space in an area where we have shallow lots in general, um, we can start to really eat into some of the parking that's available. One, you know, 120 percent of the current requirement <coughs> is two parking spaces that get eaten out. <coughs> so, at any rate, the Oasis team, uh, looking at those s statistics, decided that uh, they were not ready to recommend a change in this uh, category. Then, finally, there was a, a question put forth um, to look at uh, perhaps restricting the funds restricting the grants from uh, franchises and franchise requirements. Uh, the discussion was actually uh, pretty robust um, in the uh, OASIS team, among the OASIS team members in attendance. Um, franchise agreements, uh, and I'm summarizing here, uh, franchise agreements uh, can vary widely property to property, even within the same franchise. Uh, and uh, we felt that it would be very difficult to really kind of filter through what was required, what wasn't required, what was uh, strictly the uh, franchisee's responsibility versus a company responsibility. And then there was some general concern that this might discourage the attraction or maintaining of uh, franchise-oriented business types. And finally, uh, some things that, that weren't discussed or changed. Uh, we didn't want to change the uh, projects that came before the council or um, weren't required to come before council. Most of them do now, as you, you, know, you can tell, given the amounts of money that we're talking about. The review process by the OASIS team was now proposed to be modified in this uh, discussion. Um, finally, uh, following whatever direction we get from village council staff, will prepare amendments to the OASIS policy, <coughs> present those revisions at an upcoming meeting. Uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions uh, at this point. We also have Michael Casa, as you just heard a few minutes ago. He was... Uh, instrumental in all of this as well so he's available to answer questions thank you very much and i just want to thank on behalf of myself and the entire council the oasis team for once again convening and <coughs> spending time on this we've asked them to do it a number of different occasions which i think was entirely appropriate um, but i uh, want to publicly acknowledge and recognize their contributions and their time uh, towards this important program any questions or comments from any members of the audience with respect to the proposed revisions or modifications, excuse me, to the Ogden Avenue Site Improvement Strategy or OASIS program. 
I, that, in that case, I'll open it up for questions, comments, or discussion by the Village Council. Uh, we've talked about this subject a few times. I think we've appropriately revisited it from time to time when we see how it pans out with respect to real-world examples coming before us. Um, I think these are all, uh, I think obviously this reflects a, a careful analysis of some of the issues that were asked of the team. What are your thoughts? Commissioner Rankin. Um, I'm sorry I didn't ask this ahead of time, but what would be the approximate cost of uh, building a sidewalk for 50 feet? Because is that about the average lot size? Width? I don't know. That would be calculator. something. Yeah. That would be something for we'll, me to understand. We'll pull up an answer while the discussion continues. Um, and then the other comment is, um, I appreciate the committee looking at the franchise part of the question, but I don't think I probably properly explained my concern. And and I'm also not quite sure that I'm aware of how the application process goes. Is it a form that they fill out? Is it a written letter? Um, but what I was trying to say is in, in our business personally, we are a dealer of a product through a corporation. And based on our prior year sales, we get paid for doing certain improvements or marketing initiatives. So my concern was is if a company was going to get money from their corporation to get to do a new sign and then they were going to ask the village for a grant to get a new sign that maybe a question on the application or some sort of detail that would say are you receiving funding for signage or something from another organization or funding source just so that I don't think we should be that a, a corporate a business should be getting money from two different places. So I don't know if I'm still unclear, but that was my concern. No, I, I think the question was understood, but I, I think that, and I don't have the answer, but I think the tension arises and the, the, we start then questioning the source of funds. I mean, if somebody was borrowing the money from their uncle or from a, a lending institution, or they're getting it from a, a corporate franchise, I, I don't know if we want to slice it that, that thinly. I guess that's where the tension's coming. I understand the point uh, is that if, if it's something that corporate is going to require and provide funds for it. Uh, or corporate is just going to reimburse you. I, I, I wasn't necessarily a requirement. So if, if I could buy a sign and then get paid 75% of what I put in, and then the village is giving me money too. Right. I think we have a responsibility to understand that. Well, I guess, I guess the question is what is the, and this is entirely appropriate for the conversation, is what is the purpose of the program? If, if the purpose of the program is to incentivize uh, private dollars along with public dollars to go into achieving a public purpose, then I don't know if it's as important, at least in my mind, what the source of the private dollars is the fact is that private dollars are being put towards a public purpose, which is what I understand. One of the reasons why we wanted to revisit this mm -hmm. is that there was a view that there wasn't enough um, pub there wasn't enough private money being put in towards those public improvements um, in the right mix. And so I guess the only question I have is if, if the dollars are being put up, whether they're coming out of someone's pocket or their, their Aunt Bertha or corporate or whoever's putting the money forward, I don't know if that's as important as making sure that we have the right um, amount of public improvements as a consequence to warrant and justify the investment of public dollars. No, I agree with that, but I, I just would hate for someone to get reimbursed from us and reimbursed from Sears or whatever. It doesn't seem responsible. But I mean, if it was their brother-in-law, would, would that be okay? They shouldn't be allowed what if, what if to ask what for if, funds from two different people. But, that, 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 but then I go back to the question of are we discriminating against the source of the private dollars? If it's borrowed from a next door neighbor and they get reimbursed by their next door neighbor, is, 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 what, what, what financial limitations on the source of the funds would we want to establish? And I don't have an answer. This is just why I'm, I'm still wrestling with this issue. Sure. I understand your point. I understand the question. I, I just don't quite know how we would be able to uh, start restricting the source of the private dollars. I think that the, well, as long as the goal is to get private money to achieve a public purpose I, that warrants the 
matching of that private investment with public dollars? I'm not necessarily necessarily saying to restrict it, but I think it would be good for the committee to have that information when they're making decisions. That's all. Uh, no problem with uh, with information, although that tends to then lead to decision making. And my fear is that there would be, and I, again, to, word discriminate is probably perhaps too strong, but I think then we run the risk of you know, what's okay outside money and what's not okay outside money. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Waldeck. <laughs> Well, okay. Part of it has to do with with, with the philosophy, and uh, and and I was going to go through the five points, but since we already jumped to point number five, I'll, I'll, sl I'll slip down there. Sure. Uh, but the way I look at it, you know, we have to be. These are taxpayer dollars. This isn't, you know, manna from heaven, and it's set aside for a particular purpose. And just because we might have a growing pot of money doesn't mean we have to give it all away it's through some way or another. Uh, the purpose was invest was to invest uh, in an area, and we should be worried about the return of the money or the investment to the taxpayers. This is investment money. This isn't supposed to be just a business subsidy, and that's the way I look at it. So whatever money we're, we're putting out in this, uh, we should expect to, in the long run, and, and I realize there is, there's quite a long run, uh, we should expect to get that money back. As far as franchise, I was, I was reading the, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the material, uh, how difficult, well, if, if a business can't start up because it doesn't have the basic funding for its own franchise brand, then we shouldn't, we shouldn't have the taxpayers fund that. So it, this goes a little bit beyond what what you're dealing with, you know, as far as double double dipping, the possibility of well, double well, dipping. Well, that's a di that's a different point. Not to interrupt, but just because it's related to what Commissioner Rankin was saying. This is a workshop now, so we can be. Yeah. Um, and if if the, if the issue is not the source of the private dollars, but the issue is that public dollars shouldn't be used to achieve a solely private purpose, that I agree with 100. percent So if there's some non, you know, we we have our goals for what we want to do with the corridor, and if a public purpose is being achieved, then I think the purpose of this program has always been to, uh, if we can put a couple of, um, if we can put one public dollar in and then two private dollars go towards achieving that public purpose, and that's a good use, some would say, of, of the taxpayer dollars because we're achieving a public purpose for less than what it would cost for us to do it ourselves because we're getting private money to, to go along with it. Now, what that mix is, that's completely open to discussion. That's, that's another but the one. question is if the public dollars are being used to achieve something that is not necessarily our public purpose but a requirement of the franchise agreement, in, in your case with corporate, then I would see people in this council being um, reluctant to do that because why are we using public dollars to achieve a what we would view as a private purpose? That's there's a phrase for that, but that's backwards. Sorry, well, the, yeah. Well, what they were saying, one, one of the things they, they said was that uh, it was hard to determine whether in a franchise agreement uh, uh, whether some a aspect was uh, you know, that it was just too complicated to see. And, and I think the question is, is that if if you have a business that the only way it can exist, for example, uh, you know, if you're a popular burger chain and you have to have certain colored arches uh, and, and, you know, you want to open up, you don't go to the village and say, you know, help me fund my, my arches. Uh, you know, I need blue arches now. Right, and that would uh, be a private purpose. That's a, that's a private purpose. And so, you know, the idea that is too complex to distinguish between what's franchise and what isn't, I, I, I think is kind of a faulty one. Number one, we have the Oasis team to kind of look it over and, and you know, they'll, they'll get it right 90% of the time and the documentation, crying out loud, we're talking, you know, uh, over $10,000 if you can't come up with your, with your documentation on an application, uh, uh, you, know, wh wh why should, you know, why should you get tens of thousands of dollars uh, uh, you know, if you can't produce a, a decent documentation and justify what it is you're asking for. Uh, so I don't see that being a, a major problem. I think we need to distinguish between f what the franchise requires. If the franchise requires it, then we shouldn't be subsidizing it. The only question uh, would come up, and I agree with you, would be rare, hopefully, where the franchise requirement and the public goal are identical. For example, and I'm sure this would never exist, 
where a franchise agreement would require a franchisee to put in a sidewalk in front of the business. Well, that just happens to be our public goal, but if it's also a requirement of the franchise, that would be a different question. We win. Well, <laughs> is that something, that if, if the decision is that that's the case, then we don't fund it, and I think that raises some and other I, questions. And on the other side. But that's rarely going to happen, I think, to your point. I think most likely, if they're talking about, uh, you know, they rebrand the store and they need to paint the walls a different color, that's not a public purpose. Right. We wouldn't contribute anything towards that. And, and uh, also to that point, uh, if, you know, one of the concerns of the OASIS team was that if I uh, might chase away p opening, uh, possible businesses, and I think we have another, we have other uh, ways to attract business other than the OASIS program. We don't have to use OASIS. We've, you know, we've done it with our, uh, with our uh, uh, car auto sales businesses. Uh, you want you want a, a particular business to open up if it's a franchise or you know whatever the business is if you want it uh, you know there's there's ways other than Oasis to attract them maybe some type of a sales tax arrangement or something like that which is not only open to Oasis but I mean to the TIF district but outside the TIF district as well uh, you know for, further down Ogden and uh, uh, you know and across the village so uh, Funding can be available through through other types of agreements if the village thinks it's worthwhile, uh, and are working with our EDC to see if, you know, if it's a uh, uh, if it's something that we really want to attract, rather than slipping everything under the Oasis program. And uh, that's that was just another way of looking at it. But I, I had no problem. I, I don't see a problem with somebody coming up with documentation, and trying to judge whether it's required by the franchise or not so just to I'll, answer the question about sidewalks when you look at our sidewalk construction costs and our sidewalk matrix it's cost range from about 50 to 60 dollars per linear foot right. most of those lots are between 50 and 100 feet thank you commissioner Schnell. um my first comment i don't think is going to surprise anybody up here but um but if i don't say it i won't feel good um I am 100% in support of making them put the sidewalk in. Surprise, surprise. Um, my concern is by just getting easements, we're never going to see sidewalks, at least in probably our lifetime on Ogden Avenue. Um, but by making them put in segments, we will get portions put in, and then the likelihood of, of connecting those segments are extremely high. And just watching people in the winter walking in the street on Ogden Avenue is the scariest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And it's just something that is needed, and other communities have gotten it, and it's time for us to do it. So I am 100% in favor of that. I think it's great. I do have a question um, on the landscaping. Requiring, requiring more landscaping in the front is a great idea. I, I think the problem comes in with maintenance of that landscaping and making sure that it's still alive a year or two down the road. It, it refreshed my, my mind, my memory, are there any caveats in, in the grant application that says they have to maintain it to a certain level that if plants die, bushes die, whatever, they have to be maintained? Similar to a PUD where if you have a, a landscape plan, if stuff dies, you have to replace it. Do we require any of that? And if not, why not? We do. It's part okay. of our normal property maintenance code. Okay. So, yes. So they would have to, if, if all of a sudden bushes around a sign die, they have to, we would, we could have to keep going in and saying you have to replace this? That is correct. Whether you get an Oasis grant or not, whether you're on Ogden Avenue or, or not, any required landscaping must be maintained. You know, the thing I see a lot, particularly on, on some of the streets where there's a lot of salt, is that things do die and it doesn't seem to be replaced. So that's a concern, especially if we're requiring more in the front where there will be salt from Ogden Avenue. Um, I, I think we need to maybe step it up a bit and make sure that lawns are mowed. And, and I know we have certain height restrictions, all those other things. But I, I would just, if indeed we're going to require this, and if indeed our goal is to make Ogden Avenue look better aesthetically, I think some places do great, other places not so much. Um, and you know, perhaps we could step it up a little bit, at least as we go along, to, to show that we're serious about this and that this is a goal. And then the other question I have, as we put sidewalks in, hopefully, um, I know you can't park on the sidewalk, but 
again, I think a friendly reminder that you can't park on the sidewalk, that, that that's not part of your parking then, may not be a bad idea because as because of the, the center line in Ogden and the fact that the, the lots are not all straight and Ogden Avenue is not straight and where we can put a sidewalk, it's not going to be consistent. Parking or, or sidewalks for some businesses may be more problematic from a parking point of view than for other businesses. And as a requirement to put it in, I think a friendly reminder that you can't park over it would be advantageous. I mean, if we're going to have them, let people use them and, and let it work the way it's supposed to work. So, but I, I think staff has done a great job as usual. Again, I, I think as Martin said, thank the Oasis team for putting all this effort into revisiting this one more time. But, um, you know, we're, we're learning. I mean, the, the council is learning too as we go along and modifications I think will continually be made to this. Uh, but I think these modifications are good. And I'll ditto what Commissioner Chanel said about the sidewalks. You're right, after you get some of those segments in, if you got one on either side of you, you're going to look kind of funny if you don't have one. And that, and that definitely is a public improvement, as is uh, the landscaping. So I'll, I'll agree with, with her 100 percent. Commissioner Neustadt. Thank you, Mayor. I also agree. The sidewalks are a great uh, addition to have as a requirement. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and not talk about the five specific things, but more about the process of how this has gotten back to us tonight. A request from a council member going back to the Oasis team, coming back here for more discussion. I think that shows that this council, the Oasis team, and its partners really are open to not necessarily change, but to, to review and to see how things are working. And we'll go through this process and the application process and see how it works. Ultimately, though, this council still has the ultimate authority to say yes or no and or amend <clears throat> what the grants may or may not be. And I think that's something that maybe we need to remember or keep a closer look on as we go forward with the next round of applications. This is important work. It uh, coincides with our comprehensive plan and the financial incentives that we offer are tax dollars. And we should be able to do and require things and make those mm -hmm. tax dollars be used in the best way that this, uh, this council thinks is appropriate. So. I'm in support of these changes. I think going back to some of the original numbers is, is wise, so we can kind of see how applications come in. Um, the one question I have is, is, do we have any pending applications right now, or is the process not in its kind of in its timetable right now? Uh, we, we know that there are interested parties out there who are waiting for this process. Waiting. To play out. Okay. All right. So it, it is working, as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned. People are interested in it. They're hearing about it, um, and I think again minor or in some cases bigger changes to the, the policy are appropriate as we go forward and we can always adapt and change up here as the last straw. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Rankin, then I'll turn to my left. I know Commissioner Durkin and Barnett are probably waiting to speak as well. I'm sorry, I didn't finish all my, my questions. No, I'm so, sure I cut you off. My apologies. No, that's all right. So um, the TIF district, ha it falls under the same it falls under prevailing wage, right? So they wouldn't get necessarily better prices than us on sidewalk construction, right? Or would they? I believe it is subject to the prevailing wage, yes. No. Nope. <coughs> Thanks. Okay. Okay, so then they would have an opportunity to probably get better pricing on the project than it. I was thinking that maybe could we group it since we would be giving 75% of the money for the project, would it be beneficial for us to group it with our sidewalks? And just, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there are some economies of scale in construction efficiencies that are allowed by grouping it, which is why in their previous versions of this program, we uh, sought the easement so we could go through and install a sidewalk all at one time to get the uh, continuous nature of the sidewalk. However, there's been proven to be some challenges, not only the <laughs> land acquisition, but the parking issues that Commissioner Schnell labeled. So it's really, there are some trade-offs either way, uh, but we're proposing now to actually make the sidewalks be constructed. Okay, thanks. That's it. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry. Gentlemen? Quiet. Well, I don't really have much to add without being repetitive. Um, as long as this is a workshop thing. I'm struggling with this. It was, um, I think I was kind of the primary person asking for a review here. And, um, 
and I, we got some additional information today in that table that everybody, I think, got a chance to see, and, and some things jump out of that. My, my fundamental big problem before was it felt like we were spending more public dollars on private work than made sense to me. Um, and so one thing, I guess, between now and next week that would be interesting, I don't know if it's even possible, but if there was some way to take that table data and model what it would look like under these rules, I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> But, but I'd be interested because some things that jump out about this table, the program to this point, we've, sent, we've spent more on facade improvement um, than any other single category. We've only done, uh, you know, 6%, something like that, on landscape work. Um, site improvements, four jobs make up 75% of all the site improvement work done out of 19. Mm -hmm. And nine of them, if you count the sidewalk easements, are basically signs only. And what all that points to for me is a whole lot of public dollars spent to clean up buildings that are privately owned or to come into compliance with an existing law that's been in place for seven years, something like that. Um, it doesn't seem to me like an appropriate use of TIF dollars. TIF dollars, you know, whether they were designed for this or underground burial or whatever they might have been done, they are nonetheless tax dollars diverted either from other taxing bodies or our general fund. Um, and I just don't think that's really what we should be using them for. Um, the idea of spurring improvement is one thing, one of the, um, and I think there's some value there, but 75% of a job is still an awful lot. In my mind, I'd, I'd much rather see 50. I, I still don't like the bonus idea. Um, I certainly agree with, with Commissioner Schnell on the sidewalk issue, but I think we ought to be insisting on more specific public improvements. Two eligible improvements doesn't mean anything public necessarily. There are certainly a list of eligible improvements that don't include any public assets. So they could be doing two of those. They could be doing some landscaping that's entirely on their property and changing their sign out, and we're going to give them 75% of the project total plus maybe more if they somehow applied for a bonus. Um, I just, I keep thinking back to Ogden Avenue, and I, I've been having this thought lately about some of the things we do. How serious are we? I think you used the word serious, Marilyn. Um, how serious are we about Ogden Avenue? We've got a master plan, we've got a TIF, and we're deep into this now. And yet, our bulk of our problems really are, are lot sizes, and we're mm -hmm. taking TIF dollars, holding them back from other stuff, and I would say arguably investing in solidifying conditions we know work against the Ogden Avenue Master Plan. And that kind of bugs me. It just doesn't sit right. Um, I'm not trying to deep six the whole Oasis thing, but it's why I want to pull back quite a bit. I would hate to burn our money over five years replacing signs and doing a little bit of facade work and, and then find out that we wish we had a big pot for some sort of major redevelopment incentive program or lot consolidation program or something um, that was truly a real public asset, real public improvement maybe. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, what's, what's here before us tonight I would say certainly from where I sit is better. Um, it doesn't, it still doesn't in my mind uh, properly address the, what I think we ought to be doing with TIF dollars, even if, the per, even if part of the use is to incentivize investment. I still think it's way too much public investment in private, essentially, capital appreciation, if you will. So, if, these are my if, thoughts for the moment. Sorry for interrupting. No, go ahead. If, if we were to follow the suggestions from Commissioner Barnett, um, we may want to think about the more traditional approach to TIF funding, which we were using up until 2010 which is, is on a case-by-case -case basis, a redevelopment agreement that is focused primarily on public improvements. We have a long history of that, both in our downtown TIF district and our Ogden Avenue TIF district. Uh, this program was born in 2010 to be specifically a facade improvement program that addresses signs as well. So if we were to, to go along with Commissioner Barnett's thought process and strategy, it's certainly familiar territory for us. Uh, we may want to consider actually going back to the, the uh, previous uh, program, which is case by case, getting public improvements and investing dollars using redevelopment agreements. Yeah, it, um, I, I tend to, and I've said this before, uh, I tend to go back to what was the original purpose of the Ogden Avenue Master Plan, what was the original purpose of the Ogden Avenue Tax Increment Financing District, or the TIF, and they're not necessarily 
entirely consistent with the OASIS program. The first two items I listed, the Agnam New Master Plan, which was in 1999, and the creation of the Agnam New TIF um, shortly thereafter, obviously significantly predated the OASIS program. And, and I think when the Mag Agnam New Master Plan and the TIF district were created, they were not created with the OASIS program in mind. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, it was created for land consolidation, or you look at the Bogdan New Master Plan lays out what the, what the goals are. Establish an optimal long-range plan for improving and developing the diverse and active corridor. Enhance and beautify the corridor's physical conditions. One can debate what that is. Uh, facade improvement arguably would fall within that, but that's not the first thing I think of. Establish street skate ele streetscape elements and well, there you go. <laughs> and traffic patterns that enhance the commercial viability of the corridor. Improve traffic and pedestrian access, circulation and safety. Elimination of curb cuts. Construction of sidewalks. Mm -hmm. um, establish a unified design framework to guide future public and private improvements. That can be lot consolidation, increasing lot depth, uh, property acquisition, because we know we don't have sufficient lot depth along Ogden Avenue to support the kind of modern um, economic development that I know Mr. Casa would like to be working on for the Act Avenue Corridor. Not that the other ones are any less important, but uh, to solve some of the real puzzles that are out there, uh, you know, can't be, <coughs> the, the, as some would say, the physics aren't working. Uh, and the last one is strengthening the village's economic base by maintaining Ogden Avenue as a viable, attractive, and convenient shopping area that continues to attract shoppers from the village and the region. Uh, well, that's more of an aspiration than it is a specific criteria. Uh, but so those were laid out, and then I, I think at least the discussion that went around uh, the TIF and the Ogden Avenue Master Plan at the time certainly contemplated things like eliminating curb cuts, paying for property acquisition, uh, streetscape, street, scape, um, street lights, for mm -hmm. example, which to support certain developments can be extraordinarily expensive in the six-figure range for a street light. And you may not be able to put a development at a, a particular intersection because of the lack or the cost of that. And how do you spur that? That's one thing that you could potentially do with TIF dollars. And clearly, I think those are the things we were talking about. We're talking about replacing signs. I know that. That came Ent later. Entrance um, markers. I mean, it was $90,000 at one time, I think, for a... Wayfinding signage, yeah, yes. Well, for the signs that... that Gateway by signage, yes. Similar to what Lyle did. Um, which would be, a, again, a purely public, but you know, the OASIS program hasn't supported any yeah. wayfinding signage or gateway signs. Mm -hmm. um, the sign discussion did come up because the Ogden Avenue Master Plan specifically pointed out the... <clears throat> ugly and cluttered signs along Ogden Avenue, um, but didn't necessarily say that was to be, be appropriate use for TIF dollars. So that's why I think this discussion continues to be a good one. Um, so I just want to set the stage once again that what we started with did not contemplate Oasis. Oasis came later because there were dollars that weren't going towards traffic signs, or traffic lights, excuse me. They weren't going towards property acquisition. They weren't going towards lot consolidation. They weren't going to incentivize a big box retailer or environmental cleanup or, or things of that nature uh, that we would, I think no one would argue are a public purpose and would spur economic development. And so how could the funds be used to maybe achieve some of the, I don't know, I guess you can tell there are greater goals of the Ogden Avenue Master Plan and there are lesser goals of the Ogden Avenue Master Plan. I think OASIS, uh, for all its uh, its good work, probably focuses more necessarily on some of those lesser goals. Uh, so I, I continue to have mixed feelings about it, but I, I do agree completely with Commissioner Barnett that we ought to be very mindful of making sure that for any public dollar that invests that is invested, that A, we are achieving a public purpose, however it is we choose to define it, and B, that there be a significant and demonstrable return in the form of a match by private contribution uh, to go along with that public dollar. Because if we can spend one public dollar and get two or three or four private dollars towards one of our identified public purposes, well, that's a great use of public money. We talk about cooperation, collaboration, and, and, uh, and, and uh, communication and consolidation. That's, that's a great use of, of partnership between the public and private sector. So I think this is probably something that we should continue to do but getting the mix right, I think, is important. Uh, it's like that oil and gas mix in, a, in certain engines. If you don't get it right, the engine won't run. You get it just right, and it runs really efficiently. I think that's what we're trying to do, is get that mix right. But I'm also mindful of the fact that we have people that are waiting to apply. And I, while I understand that we are the ultimate arbiters of the outcome of these things, 
I am a little troubled by being in a situation where we're not managing expectations. We're not managing the expectations of those who wish to participate in this program. And we all know that uh, the private sector abhors uncertainty because people tend not to hire, they tend not to invest, they tend not to do things when there's uncertainty. And while you can never be guaranteed complete certainty, I do think we owe it to anyone who might be interested in this program to, to provide some degree of management of their expectations so they know if they come forward with a program that meets what we've described as, yeah, that's what we're looking for, they ought to have some reasonable degree of certainty that it, not necessarily, but a reasonable degree of certainty that it will be approved. Otherwise, I, I think we're, I, I think we're just setting things up for more uncertainty and, and failure. I'll just just to add one thing about that mix, Mayor, the council may or may not recall we spoke about it rather quickly during the budget process that with the FY13 budget, we did adjust the mix in the Ogden Avenue TIF funds uh, where we actually lowered the amount budgeted for the OASIS program, increased the amount budgeted for sidewalk and streetscape, and reserved the substantial budget for redevelopment incentives to try to spur uh, catalytic sites. This was uh, based on a strategic discussion by the executive board of the EDC. So we do have some parameters set in our budget as well that address that mix issue, which came up again in 2013. Um, I believe, Mayor, you were at that meeting. We had that discussion. Right. And, that's, and that's, but I'm glad you pointed that out because that's the macro mix. Correct. That's managing expectations of how our budget level dollars will be used. I, I was speaking more specifically to the micro mix of on a project by project level basis, what is the right mix of public and private dollars? Because I, that's an absolutely appropriate question. And I don't know, maybe we can't answer it in advance such that people would have that degree of certainty. I don't know, but I certainly would like to, in every situation, be able to be entirely confident, <coughs> be able to explain in an entirely defensible manner to any person inquiring that this was a great use of public dollars because we achieved a public purpose as identified in our planning documents and we got the private sector to kick in for it. That's really what we're trying to accomplish. So shouldn't we always be less than half then? I mean, mm -hmm. it, just as a fundamental starting point for that, I mean, I, even if I don't ideally know, yes, at the very least, it ought to not be, I mean, more, be more public point. dollars than public dollars. Even if you get some sort of two to one or three to one return, I, I still don't see how you want to have more public dollars in the project than private. But remember, that's what their grant is. They most of these projects, you can see the last column that says estimated total investment. So that's you know, there's certain things that are eligible for the grant, and then there's other things that aren't that they still did the improvements on, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's the differential. That's where the, that's where the multiplying factor is. That's why it's two to one, roughly. I, 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 I somehow think I've had this conversation before, and it was, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and it was back, no, I know we have, and it was back in, in 99 and, and the very early 2000s, when the village, I don't want, this is a term other people use. The village was in the real estate business where we, we used um, public dollars to try to assemble parcels so that they could be redeveloped in a way that would increase the public good. Um, but there were a lot of people who took exceptions to that and um, there were a lot of people who were very upset about that. So, you know, I, I think when we talk about in particular, Ogden, where the lots are very narrow, you really would have to somehow, a developer would have to assemble parcels to expand it. And, and I'm not sure this is exactly what you were saying, but trying to use TIF dollars to do that, I, I, or even help it, I think would go contrary to the message that was loud and clear um, from the public back in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. You know, people just basically said, the village should just get out of that business and let the, the private sector do it. So, you know, where the fine line is between helping to assemble parcels and somehow being um, uh, helping, it, a, there's a line there. And, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure we did cross it, but there were a lot of people in our community who felt we did cross it. So I, I mean, I, what I'm saying is I think we need to be careful as we look towards some of the loftier goals of the Ogden Avenue plan, which is to, to have larger parcels, do redevelopment, do certain things, because I'm not sure that 
the, the Downers Grove residents would be happy if we used public monies to help acquire those properties. I, there's, there's a fine line here, and, and I know that's not necessarily what this whole discussion is about, but if we're talking about cutting back the OASIS grant to help to do some of the loftier goals of the Ogden Avenue Master Plan, then I think that is what we're talking about. So it, it's, a, it's a philosophical discussion that maybe the community needs to have again, I don't know, uh, or the council needs to have again with community input, but um, it was not well received um, think going back to some of the downtown redevelopment, um, you know, yes, what we got was very nice, but the process that went to getting it was not well accepted by everyone, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, and they're different, they're different, not to sound like a book, but they're different shades of that gray, because right. if it's facilitating an acquisition, that's, that's one thing. If you're actually using eminent domain and, and acquiring parcels like was necessary for uh, a clearly public benefit, which is the Belmont Great Separation yeah. Project, I mean, parcels had to be acquired to support that project, and certainly there were people who preferred the property That's wasn't acquired. That's not private development. Well, I understand that, but I'm yeah. saying when you utilize public dollars and, and, and public means but to acquire parcels in support of a project like that, few would argue that that's yeah. not a public benefit. But when you start getting into Ogden and Lee, uh, what right. dollars should be spent in order to um, facilitate the development of a parcel that otherwise has been laying fallow for decades and not contributing anything to and I don't know the answer to it. I'm just saying I think we need to be careful as we tread well, down course, the road. Of course, but I mean, I mean, candidly, the Ogden Avenue Master Plan and our comprehensive plan all contemplate that to fully support in the modern fashion um, successful economic development in certain corridors, uh, assemblage of parcels, and, and in fact intruding into residential areas to in order to make parcels larger to support modern economic development uh, is entirely not only contemplated, but th that may be the solution. Now, who does that? Well, you have a developer that comes by and buys everything up. Ideally, that'd be great. But if that's not going to happen because of impediments in the private sector that the public sector can spur, and that's, that thus gets you something the community has long viewed as a desirable goal, then yes, some people may not necessarily like the means, but they want the outcome. And the question is, if you don't, if you want the outcome, but are against the means, you're never going to get to what you want. No, but all I'm saying is that conversation is a conversation that is a lot more complex than we can. Well, think well it's you, absolutely. But, it's but I think it's something that's in the comprehensive plan. For you know, example. It's, it's one that's been had though. To some degree, it's been had many times. It's been had many times, but. And I look at look at the, the Lee project that, that was proposed and, and the fewer that came out of the residents that bordered on it. Well, that was about the project itself, not right. necessarily and I the that. use of, of TIF dollars. I, no. I didn't hear anybody objecting to that. So anyway, all I'm saying is that if indeed we're going to, to, to cut back the OASIS program in, in light of trying to spur either acquisition of properties or redevelopment of larger parcels, it's a conversation that really needs to be had again so that we can right. move well, down well, the two path. Things that that one, I think not only has that conversation been had, I think that goal's already up on the wall as a goal. Um, uh, not everyone may, may appreciate it, but it's there. Okay. But I also don't think that we're saying get rid of Oasis so that we can apply it towards land acquisition. I was simply describing the, the original purpose of all this was not necessarily facade improvement but that's sort of what has happened because, again, I would call it one of the minor or the lesser goals of the Ogden Master Plan, which is aesthetics. Um, I think the major goals are the ones I was talking about. I think I would prefer to see the dollars spent on the major or the macro goals, um, but we're dealing with the lesser goals. So now the question is, what is an appropriate use of mm -hmm. public dollars to score uh, achievement of some of these lesser goals? And I, and I think the concern that uh, some have raised is, that there's too much public and not enough private. Okay. I just was hearing Commissioner Barnett say that he was looking at more of the loftier goals as opposed to. I, I was saying both things. I was, okay. I, well, and I'm not saying you weren't, but I, but what oh, I, was I was hearing was you were going towards the loftier ones too. Yeah, and what I what I'm afraid of is those loftier goals, are <coughs> not precluded per se, but we're arguably investing in existing businesses or existing yeah. parcels that don't fit what the broader loftier goals of the comprehensive plan and master plan for Ogden Avenue suggests we're trying to achieve. So whether it's, as the mayor was describing, money 
you know, held back for that. That's not necessarily what I'm saying. But, I, but when we invest $100,000 in a single parcel, get almost no public benefit, we also have pretty much have solidified that is going to be there for a while. And that, to me, work is kind of working against the master planning for Ogden Avenue. That's why I made the comment about how serious are we. Because mm -hmm. I think we're kind of building in a, a slowing down of the change and in, in, in efforts towards the Ogden Avenue master plan. Although, going back to uh, Manager Thielman's point, the, the budget document now reflects a, a, a greater focus, I would say, on those greater goals of the Ogden Avenue master plan than the, than the lesser goals by at least the budgetary expression. But even without that, I, I'm pretty confident that if we had budgeted, if we budgeted half a million dollars for the OASIS program, and as long as people weren't at a point where they had a reasonable expectation of getting their grants approved, if we had one of those greater opportunities come by, I, I think this organization would be very quick to apply that entire budget to support that kind of greater goal. I mean, the, the, I think the problem has been is we haven't had those greater mm -hmm. goal opportunities, not from any fault or lack of trying, mind you, but just for various reasons, only the economy, this, that, whatnot. Uh, so we've been trying to achieve some of the lesser goals. And there we're talking about what is the proper fuel mix for, for that level of investment. But I don't think we'd hesitate for a second if we had you know, an outstanding win-win-win opportunity at, at Lee and Ogden to commit the entirety of the budget for um, the TIF to that project because that has been an, a goal that's been described for decades. I mean, so I, I don't see it as precluding opportunities, but I mean, I'll just say that right now. I would, I would, I would ditch those smaller ones in a heartbeat for the bigger ones. Yeah. I, I think the I, and, and the old concept was let's go out and buy a bunch of property, spend public dollars, get the property, and then let's see what we can do with it. See if we can attract how, what we can get for it. And I think that's where that was know, that's where we yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. where we fall that's down. Where we got in and and there's probably different ways and different means. Uh, you know, we attract businesses with with sales tax promises, and I mean, you know, we have, we have a lot more tools in the bag, and 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 we know that going out and buying and hoping that you know build it and, or buy it and they will come uh, really, really doesn't work. Uh, I just don't want to get, go down that road again, I guess is, is the bottom line. In, well, that, you, do, you don't want to do it the same way, right. but as the mayor says, if you, if you have an opportunity, you want to be in a position to take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, getting back to, to Bob's point, on the, I, I agree with him on the, on the OASIS pr uh, program and the facades. Uh, you know, I think when you're talking about public things like sidewalks and, and even the landscaping, because the idea is if you're going down Ogden Avenue and it looks attractive, you're, you're, you're thinking that you might invest there. Uh, you know, we have to look at this as money out, but it's an investment. You know, we expect to get something, something back in some way, shape, or form. And, and with the facades, you, you don't get as much of that. And, and, and it does bug me, too, that we're putting in more than the, than the private. I mean, if, if I was, you know, if you still wanted to do facades, I'd say it'd be more like a 25-75 split. Uh, because, cause, you know, you got to get the private, the, the, the business owner or the lot owner to, uh, uh, to do the investment. And, and we could match that based on uh, requirements. Signs, I've, I've always had a problem with the sign situation. Uh, especially when we have good businesses that uh, I think we killed that one. Yeah. Well, you know, they're they're, they're still out there. They're still part of the uh, program. Uh, like I say, it's still a problem with that. But I'd like to change the, uh, you know, more like a twenty-five seventy-five for the uh, the more private uh, portions, like the facade. But uh, it's up to you guys in the future to uh, to meet and, <laughs> and and plan. I mean, I don't mind showing up at the meeting and commenting, but. Uh, uh, you know, you, uh, yeah, they how, you, they how really you get five minutes. About, <laughs> I'm already used up all my time. What am I going to do? Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're not we're not achieving what we planned with the original with the original TIF uh, TIF money, and uh, maybe we need to be more creative. And you guys got some time. I don't know uh, when's the next opportunity. You think well, August we, or we, something? We, we may we may yet have those opportunities because opportunities arise all the time. Uh, I think it's just like, again, it's not from lack of trying, it's the various factors that those type of 
greater goals haven't pre presented themselves in a in a, man, in, a, in, a, in a manifestation in which we found desirable, let's put it that way. Projects, I'm sure Mr. projects come up all the time. They're just not necessarily ones that we... I'm sure Mr. Castle support. would come running if he, if he found something, somebody of interest, and all they needed was X, Y, and Z, and I'm sure he'd be running into Dave's office saying, have I got a deal for you? So well, all right. They're open to it. So let's go back to... Uh, but I'm, go, I'm for the 2575 on the, on, on the facade type, private type uh, investment. All right, because the, there were five items that were presented to us in this uh, by the uh, OASIS team. Uh, three were for recommendations, two were to not make any changes. The three that were proposed were to make changes in the, the mix of the applicant match, uh, the maximum grant amount, and the requirement of sidewalk, the landscaping and franchise funding components were, were uh, ones that were not recommended to changes be made. On the match, going back to that, um, I, I hear support for the 75-25% match, but to go back to your point, uh, Bob, we need to adjust that mix even more? I, I'd like to see us love it. I, I'm more in line with what Bill's thinking in general. I'd certainly like to see us limit to 50%. I don't want to. I don't want the village in more. I mean, I understand they might be making additional investments, but in the part we're paying for, I don't want us in more than the more than the owner. So no more than a fifty percent match. That's that's where my head is. Yeah. And, and 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 this is where I think it would be important to have that out there so that applicants would know that don't expect to get more than a fifty percent match. But to Commissioner Newstat's point, if we were given this proposal for whatever reason, the merits of it were, oh, okay, well, in this case, you know, I, I want to encourage this because we're achieving all kinds of public goals. We think we're getting a great return on the investment. We have the flexibility to do that because ultimately it, it's, it's up to the council. But I'm, I'm, I just want to make sure we're not, I want to manage expectations, so I don't want to put applicants out there to be submitting, and then, and then we cut them off at the knees later. I'd, I'd rather be more generous on the back end when we have a proposal that in the eye of the public and in the eye of the council, well, okay, that's a great project. We want to facilitate that. It's not quite the redevelopment agreement approach that you're talking about. Right, but we but could apply closer. that there. If we had sort of one that transcends the OASIS program, doesn't fit well within it, however we define the OASIS program, but we think there's a great community value, then we could always just draft an agreement and not give them OASIS funding, just traditional redevelopment agreement funding. So we wouldn't want to say that uh, uh, it, you're never going to get more than that, but don't expect on this program. More than 50% match. On this program. On this program. I, I just want to rule out there could be situations where even Commissioner Barnett would say, well, okay, that one, that one, I, I think that's even a great me? project. Even you. Even me. <laughs> even me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I, I know Commissioner Barnett had suggested to us uh, in an email about, you know, increasing the public improvement por portion, portion, excuse me, if I could speak. Um, but we could, you're not talking about that tonight. I didn't know if you were going to bring that up. But, I mean, what if it's even a percent of the grant, percent of the project application amount or that's devoted to that, uh, the public improvements part of it? Would that help you? Describe that to me again. Yeah, could you be more specific? Okay, so I looked at the wonderful chart that we were provided and I looked at landscape improvements and site improvements because those are the public portion of the improvements I think that you were interested in seeing more of the grant being applied to right um, no no well I give you a whole bunch of political double talk sort of my point <laughs> of the public improvements was public was it basically improvements that benefit of the public and I'm not talking about pure aesthetics so I was talking about sidewalks stormwater detentions curb cuts those kinds of things and they fall that, under those categories they do but those categories that are on there aren't exclusive to that kind of work they include right. other things as well so those numbers aren't necessarily the amount that's been spent mm -hmm. on the things that I call public improvements okay well I guess what I was like looking at what the percentage of the grant was devoted to those two categories you know by by project. So for example, like the Downers Grove Animal Hospital, 
of the grant was devoted to those two categories. So, I mean, maybe that would be a way to have a better acceptance of the program if there was a percentage. I don't know. Maybe that's silly. Is there a way to get to what I think Bob and, and you are saying? I, I, the, the talk we went to at Lincoln Center was talking about rain gardens and, and the fact that they do a lot for stormwater management, runoff, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, is there a way, which is also green space, is, is there a way, and I don't even know if this is possible, but is there a way to <coughs> perhaps pick the brain of the, what is it, conserv the, the conservation? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and ask them about ways to reduce runoff off of the parking lots on Ogden Avenue by enhancing certain landscape features. Yes. And, and, you know, that way I think we would get to some of what Bob's talking about, which is runoff stormwater management, um, more of, of things that are of a public benefit mm -hmm. because there is so much asphalt on Ogden Avenue, um, and, and kind of put that into the grant so that if you did your, your landscaping in such a way that it also benefited stormwater management, then that's a huge public benefit. That, that's why one of the other thoughts that I'd had circulated was this 125 versus 110 percent. Okay. Same kind of a concept. Right? Okay. But so, I, I'm just thinking that, you know, if indeed we could get some information to, to <coughs> excuse me, to put in the grant or to, to provide to the individuals who are, are going to be doing this, give them ideas um, of ways of, of managing both, then I, there's a huge public benefit to that. Mm -hmm. One, you show the, the, the public how they could incorporate some, incorporate some of this into their own homes, too. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a win-win situation for everyone. Instead of just putting three pieces of sod in the front, you know, if we could somehow do something else, I think that would be huge. Yes, we can restructure the program to so, get what any desired outcome we want within the TIF eligible expenses. And the concept I'm hearing here would be moving away from the categories that they're now described, which originated as a facade improvement program and a signage improvement program. Uh, also had elements of site improvement. But if you want to go to a more traditional public improvement grant program, those are certainly um, well established both in our community and many others. And then you're just talking about redefining the categories. And they become much more traditional public improvement focused, stormwater, uh, uh, right away improvements, those types of things. So yes, we can do all well. Those. Well, and one can imagine situations where, as part of that overall, they're also doing these other things. But we can say, well, that's on your dime. This is on our dime. Yes, and there are programs where you can say you only get uh, matching funds for the public portions, but you also have to have not only a private match, but a private investment component as well. Right. So these these programs exist all over. Yes, we can do that. Could when you were talking, Dave, a little earlier about. Um, I think it was Bill that first mentioned it, the idea of a redevelopment agreement should it be sort of a more extraordinary project. Um, couldn't that, wouldn't that also, if we were going to head down that path, wouldn't that also really justify the elimination of the bonus component of this program? I mean, it, it could, if that's you know, the if way we want to If we're proceed. looking at, if it's really big and exceptional, we'd want to be talking about a redevelopment agreement of some kind, then what's the point of the bonus thing? Mm -hmm. The, yes. the guidelines just have to reflect that that's an option. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating back in the old days of the Community Grants Commission when, when they yeah. were doing something. There was a pamphlet that was developed that said, here are the guidelines that you should be mindful of when you approach and request dollars. It wasn't a hard and fast, carved in stone, if you don't do this, yes, if you don't do that, no, because uh, there, there was a, a review of, of each request and the purpose for which it was being put on a case-by-case -case basis, but there were some guidelines laid out so that uh, you could d differentiate between those that fell squarely within the guidelines and those that maybe didn't. And given that you have a limited pool of funds, it was it was made it possible to um, identify and prioritize who should take precedence. And, and to that point, it's important to note that our current application uh, materials going back to 2010 say at the bottom if you don't meet the criteria of this program, yet you want to explore an idea with us, you may be eligible for a redevelopment agreement. And we put it right on there because we don't want to use the program to dissuade development uh, investment. Well, and it, it, right, and it may be that it's a matter of how this is, is marketed because yes. I, I know that the goal has been to get people actually utilize the program because we want them to participate in order to achieve the public 
benefits that have been defined since 1999 is part of the Ogden Master Plan. That, that we do want, even yes. if they're lesser goals. Um, and this has to be sold. Mr. Cass and others have to actually try to get people to do it. And so maybe it's a question of not having the bottom in, you know, an eight-point font or something like that. But exactly. it's more, you know, we want to reach out, and there are public dollars available if the right mix is there to achieve some of these goals. Let's have a conversation. And, and, and Mayor and Council, if I could, we uh, brought some very specific uh, tweaks or modifications to an existing facade improvement program that also has other elements. Tonight's conversation and conversations I've had with each of you uh, have brought up questions about sort of the fundamental structure and should we be using the funds for these categories. And what I might suggest is perhaps uh, we could uh, continue <coughs> these discussions with a one-on-one -on -one fashion and then I could report out what we're hearing and see if we really want to keep the structural elements of OASIS in fine-tuned funding matches and program elements or if we're really saying these aren't the things we want to invest public dollars in and then come up with a program that matches those expectations. In other words, in short, to be continued. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, un understood. I, I do want to not put anyone on the spot, but I also want to give Mr. Cass an opportunity to, if you'd like to say anything or want to say something now, I want to give you the chance. But do not feel compelled, because I understand there's been a lot of discussion. You probably want to take it in and process it before commenting, which we would appreciate. But if there was some burning point you wanted to make now, I didn't want to preclude you from doing that. So it's entirely at your discretion. Yeah, I probably would want to have a chance to talk to the other members of the OASIS team, but I, I guess one point I wanted to make is putting the, any grant money aside, the biggest hurdle to development on Ogden is something that you know better than I do, and it's the, it's the lack of lot depth. Mm -hmm. And just the other day, David and, uh, and Tom and I were meeting with a developer that got a pretty nice project they're proposing on Ogden. It's only in, in the early stage, but the dot of the discussion was about boy, this lot isn't deep enough and we're going to have a parking and circulation problem. So my hesitancy on the, on the additional landscaping is that we have to lose a couple of parking spaces and more, make it more difficult to circulate. It could mean that the project doesn't go forward. So you know, I, I want to find, try to find ways to make it easier for someone to develop on these small lots. You factor in the size of the building, circulation, parking, landscaping, setback requirements, easement agreements, boy, you don't have a lot of land left. And so um, in many cases, it's not just our code that requires X number of parking spaces. It's the, it's the company themselves that can't be successful. They can't, their customers can't park their cars. So I think we have to keep that in mind that ultimately what we're looking for is not to get grant money out, it's to get right. the deal done. Right. So. It, y yes, and I think that's important point because we need to maintain that flexibility on all elements of this because there may be lots of projects that we think would be big wins for the community, solid contributors to the uh, commercial corridor, forwarding many if not all the goals of the Ogden Avenue Master Plan, but they might not necessarily have an increase <coughs> in green space. Well, we'd like to have green space, but I'd like to have all that other stuff too. And we just have to assess everything on a case-by-case -case basis. So we don't want to preclude anything. Uh, but again, I think it goes back to that's one of the things we would like to see, if possible, but if it's going to mean we're going to lose out on, a, on an opportunity that a, a anyone, any objective uh, viewer would, would agree would be a welcome addition to that corridor, then I don't, I don't want to scare that away. So we want to be able to do everything, is what we want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'll place expectations on the public money. That's the thing. Yeah. To use that as an example, there's nothing in the Oasis that demands a certain amount of green space. It's if you want to get public funding for your landscape improvements, it needs to be extraordinary. And so the question just is, should that be more extraordinary? Not, I mean, if you, if you only want to do the basic minimums required by existing code, then it's fine. You just don't get Oasis money for it. I mean, right. We're not preventing development as a result of trying to improve landscape requirements. Right, right, or there may be other tools that we would use or other uh, vehicles that we would pursue in order to, to capture that new opportunity that may not be Oasis at all. Right. Because ultimately, uh, there are a number of, I think it goes back to Commissioner Zabital, who's always talking about the tools in the toolbox. Yeah. I mean, this is a tool in the toolbox. We have, a, we have other tools. Other comments or questions? Are we resolved that uh, this is to be continued? Okay. Yep.
All right, well, that was a classic example of a workshop if I ever saw one. <laughs> and I'll wait for the summary of what you all said, so. <laughs> well, we were going to ask you to summarize. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll summarize, all right. I want to talk about leaves. <laughs> All right, well that, believe it or not, brings us to the other item on our first reading, our workshop uh, portion of our meeting, which is uh, item 8B. Uh, which is consideration of a three-year contract for street sweeping services. And here to present information on this item is our Public Works Director, Nan Newland. Good evening. I'm here to present a motion to award a three-year contract for street sweeping services to Hoving Clean Sweep LLC of West Chicago, Illinois, in the amount of $384,053.66. Street sweeping in the village accomplishes three primary goals. The first is to improve water quality by reducing pollutants that are um, in runoff from stormwater. The second one is to remove leaves and tree debris from the right of way during the fall season. And the third is to improve the appearance of streets and parking lots by removing litter and other debris. Under this proposed contract, the schedule for street sweeping would remain as it currently is, um, which includes sweeping between the months of April and October. Um, it's monthly sweeping of curbed streets, weekly sweeping of the downtown business district, bi-weekly sweeping of municipal lots, and three fall sweepings on all curb streets between mid-October and early December. There are a couple of new features that are included by Hoving Clean Sweep in this contract. Um, they include the use of, use of regenerative air sweepers in place of the um, mechanical broom sweepers that are currently used. These have a little bit more of a vacuum type action and they um, are able to remove smaller particulates from the street which leave it cleaner and um, produce less dust during sweeping. We've also been told they're significantly quieter than the uh, sweepers that, uh, the mechanical broom sweepers. Um, the sweepers have a larger tank capacity, which will allow them to more efficient, will allow them to efficiently move leaves from their operation on the street to the transfer site. Unlike our current uh, operation where we um, use a truck and one of our personnel to pick up the leaves from the sweeper and move it to the transfer site. So that will um, eliminate the use of one of our trucks and a person during the leaf operation that we'll be able to reassign to other maintenance tasks. The street sweepers that will, are proposed to be used will also be outfitted with GPS trackers that will be allowed to <coughs> log into their system and see where their sweepers are at any one moment and also to see what areas of town they've covered so be able to give us better information to residents about where they've been and when we'll be, able, when we'll be in their neighborhoods. Under our purchasing policy, a call for bids was for these services was issued and we received three bidders. The low bid for these, this three-year contract was Hoving Clean Sweep. Um, they have not held this contract with the village in the past. However, we received positive references from the communities of Woodridge, Lyle, and Carroll Stream. They responded that Hoving Clean Sweep performed all elements of the project scope above average and worked closely with the public and with their staff. We recommend approval of this three-year contract with Hoving Clean Sweep, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the audience with respect to the proposed street sweeping item? Questions from Council? Commissioner Durkin? Yeah, thank you. The uh, addition, I didn't see in here the additional uh, uh, cost for a street sweep if we needed to do that in case there was a emergency that came up or if leaves were decided to fall later on in the season after the actual uh, area was swept for the season. There are some on-call provisions in the contract that allow for emergency sweeps and for special event sweeps. Um, in the event of the fall, what we do is we time it. Mm -hmm. um, if we have a late drop of leaves, we wait and we hold maybe the third cycle of sweeping till a little bit, a week or two later to allow us to catch that later leaf drop. So that's, right. include, so what, that's included in the price. Okay, but what's the extra cost? So I mean, if we have this contract for six sweeps, is that what, what it is, six, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's actually nine throughout. Or the nine sweeps. Three so if we cycles, need a ten three sweeps or, or whatever, yeah. what's that additional cost? I didn't see that. We'll, we'll get to that information before okay. we vote on this item. Any other questions or comments? Actually, I do. You know, I think that this is, I think the big highlight, if there's one thing that aggravated the world out of me in the fall, was having our staff ride around and wait. They almost look like other employees of the state that would sit around and wait for the <laughs> snow to fall while they were waiting for the leaf 
sweeper to pick to dump their load. So I think this this is a great addition to this contract where we eliminate our the need for our staff and our equipment to, to transfer that. So kudos to whoever was able to get that in here. I think that's important to note. We Thank agree. You. Thanks. More examples of lean government applied in our bid spec. So great job. Terrific. Thank you. That ends our first reading tonight, Mayor. Fantastic. That brings us to item nine on the agenda of the Mayor's report. I have no report tonight. Brings us to item 10, our manager's report. Uh, Doug Kozlowski will present uh, a brief report on the storm water utility. Good evening, Mr. Kozlowski. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council members. Uh, I'm here this evening to provide you with an update on the implementation of the storm water utility. Uh, we have completed the second month of the utility, which was approved in August of 2012 and implemented in January of this year. Um, one of the most important benefits of, of the fee-based system that we have is that all properties now share in the cost of the system and monthly fees provide the predictable funding source needed to operate and maintain it. Uh, all of the major elements of the stormwater utility program are working. The amount billed as well as the credits, credits and incentives issued uh, are in line with the budget and expectations. So here is actually where we are at today. Uh, we have 85% of the total amount billed in January and February has been paid on time. And this rate of bill payment is in line and similar to the village's uh, other billing processes. So for example, at the same time last year, we had 88% of the total amount billed for water service paid by this time. Um, our incentives uh, haven't changed since our last report. We have 66 incentives that have been issued to date uh, in the amount of $4,800. Uh, the next item actually is a new addition to the credits that we have offered, and people have taken us up on those credits. And St. Mary of Gaston School has applied for and will be receiving a 100% education partnership credit that will be starting in April. So that's the, the, a new update uh, for uh, the credits that have been issue, issued. And as I've mentioned in the past, we've uh, District 58, the Park District, and Sanitary District all have uh, <coughs> credits. And there is uh, one appeal uh, that has been uh, heard at this time. Um, Another nice uh, update to provide you with is, that, is the fact that in February, the village received an environmental appreciation award from the Conservation Foundation for the implementation of the stormwater utility and protecting area waterways. Uh, the program's fair approach to billing, the innovative use of credits, incentives, and the educational partnership uh, were cited as key reasons for the issuance of this award to Downers Grove for the stormwater utility. So we wanted to present you with that information. And so in summary, uh, I would remind you that the utility was launched on time, that the initial financial uh, numbers are in line with the budget and expectations, and we will continue to provide you with uh, monthly update reports on the progress of the utility. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a message from the Village of Downers Grove. Well, we of course I feel like I should be eating before. dinner now. Exactly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kozlowski. Any questions or comments? Mr. Kozlowski, uh, Commissioner Shaw. Just, just one. Can you um, highlight the stormwater, the, the stormwater education workshop for businesses that's going to be held later this month? Uh, yes, we month. are holding an educational workshop on April 3rd. It will be from 9 to 10 a.m. at the Lincoln Center. Uh, that is in cooperation with the Conservation Foundation. And there is plenty of information on that. It's our top story on our website at this time. But if anybody has any questions, it is primarily for uh, business owners and, and operators. And not for and, profits. Pardon me? And not for profits. Yes, and, yes as well, not for profits. And uh, so if anybody uh, has any questions about that, they can uh, reach out to us here at Village Hall, 630-434-5500 or check out the website uh, for more details. I actually went to the one for residents, and it was, one, it was very well uh, attended. In fact, it was standing room only. But the information that was presented and the vendors that were there were superb. Um, so I would highly recommend this, particularly for not-for-profits, but also for businesses. I think a lot of the churches could benefit from some of the information that will be presented of this. 
because there's obviously been some concerns and I think that the information that this particular work, hopefully the information that this particular workshop could disseminate would be beneficial to, to, to those entities. So as I said, the one for residents was just wonderful and well received by everybody that was there. So it was a lot of people. Terrific, thank you. Yes, we received very good feedback on yeah. that. It was well, well presented. Other questions or comments? Thank you for the update. That Welcome. ends our manager's report tonight, Mayor. Thank you. It brings, thank you. It brings us to item 11, our village attorney's report. I do not have a report. You know, sometimes when we don't have reports from our village attorney, that's a good thing. Brings us to item 12. <laughs> council member reports new business. As is customary, I'll take any new business items first. Any members of the council? Any members of the council have any items of new business? Hearing none, then I will ask for council member reports. Commissioner Barnett. Uh, Mayor, we don't have an old business uh, section, so I'm going to just clarify something because it's eating at me a little bit, and you'll have to bear with me. It's uh, certainly a privilege to speak last, and that uh, occasionally rears itself in interesting ways. Um, the, some of the conversation that began the active agenda tonight needs to be clarified. There is uh, no piece of me and my thinking and my logic that is critical of our staff our employees but as these contracts have been discussed and negotiated one of the critical elements that is missing from where I sit and what I was trying to clarify is certainly I am aware of and understand the arbitration process the limits that are placed on that how that works in Illinois relative to public safety employees in particular but we collectively we not our staff not our employees chose not to pursue and even ask about some of the issues that have been important to me. And that's one of the things that happens when you're in the minority, I understand that. And that's, I'm okay with that. This isn't, a, this isn't a whine on Bob's behalf for not getting his way. What it is, is when I sit and try and explain my nay votes on things, it would be appreciated if it would be sort of acknowledged that we've just collectively decided not to pursue and ask those questions. And that's fair, that's a decision, that's why there's an odd number of us. But what's been characterized up to this point has been generally that you can't. And so when I tried to clarify that tonight, we decided to run down the road of describing the arbitration process. We're all aware of the arbitration process. We're well aware of the precedents that are set in the arbitration in the state of Illinois, and they make some of these things difficult. But difficult to me is not the same as don't try. And so I just want to make it clear to those that are watching and whatever record is established that the complaint I have is with our reluctance to try and even ask. Commissioner Newstead pointed out it was three months of negotiations and fairly quick to be sure. And in three months we couldn't ask the question. And that's okay. That's what happens when you're in a minority. I get it. But it's important that people, for me at least, understand my vote and understand the reasoning behind it. That's all I've got for this evening. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Durkin. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this evening we are mourning the passing of retired firefighter paramedic John Green. John recently succumbed to the long battle with cancer. John was a great contributor to the Downers Grove community. He was a 21-year member of the Downers Grove Fire, Fire, Fire Department, retiring in 2001. He started his career as a paid-on-call firefighter and later joined the department as a full-time firefighter paramedic. John was one of six paramedics who pioneered the first full-time fire department paramedic program for the village of Downers Grove. This program was a huge success that brought our fire department to a new level of pre-hospital patient care. John had, pa had passion for the job and the patients he cared for. He was dedicated to his fellow firefighters and citizens he served. He will be truly missed by all. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Green family during this very difficult time. I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to make these statements for our council collectively. I had the opportunity to live in the, down the street, two homes away from the Green residence, and I only knew him as Mr. Green, former firefighter, uh, former employee at the Village of Downers Grove. I was really moved and impressed when I read that he was one of the six original paramedics who had helped bring our station, our fire department, our program to the level it is today. It's those insights, it's that thought, it's that passion and everything that he had had along with the others that got us to where we are today. And, and with that, I, I uh, prayers and thoughts are with the family and so on and so forth. Thank you. <clears throat> Likewise, well said, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Schnell. 
Um, this, this sounds trite in comparison to that, but several of us um, were at the Omega today for the grand opening. And yeah, was huh? it was great. Uh, the place looks awesome. It's, it's clean, it's fresh, it's, it looks wonderful. Um, and the rolls were great. We didn't get, we didn't get anything else but rolls and Diet Coke, but it, they were good. Um, we, we obviously didn't have a lot of time. Um, but the bottom line is it's, it's nice in line with, I think, what, what uh, Mike Cass is trying to do. It's nice to have a business that went away, come back. Um, and it, they did invest a considerable amount of money into that building. Uh, the old sign is down. There's a beautiful new sign out front. Um, it's in line with, I think, what Mike is trying to do um, along Ogden and throughout the business community in our, in our town. But I um, want to welcome them back um, and hope they do well, um, because obviously that's sales tax revenues. So it's good for us, and it's good for them, and it's good for business. So welcome back. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Neustadt. Thank you, Mayor. Yesterday was the 39th anniversary of the death of Officer Richard J. Barth, the only Downers Grove police officer to die in the line of duty. Uh, I only bring this up tonight to remind not only our police department, as I don't need to remind them, but all of our residents that no call is routine in Downers Grove. Today is a perfect example of that, of the uh, uh, events that happened in our downtown. Just like 39 years ago, uh, Officer Barth responded to a routine call and didn't make it home. So. Thank you to all the Downers Grove Police uh, men and women and the fire department and all public servants who serve our village and our state. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rankin. Uh, next week is spring break. If you're going on vacation, you can fill out a vacation house watch form with the Downers Grove Police Department so that uh, they keep an eye on any suspicious activity that may occur at your home while you're not there. So the form is on our website. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Waldeck. I have no report, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, for myself, I will, it, it is a privilege to speak last, and I appreciate Commissioner Barnett's uh, stated goal of trying to make sure that uh, things are properly understood in context, because my comments are not to engage in some kind of debate or conversation. Um, there were other opportunities to do that, and they took place. Uh, I'm simply also trying to make sure that things are properly understood in context, and sometimes uh, when something is stated or implied, uh, it leaves a suggestion, whether intended or unintended, uh, that I've been doing this long enough that I know it may appear as a quote or a headline and I think it's only fair that folks hear things in context. Uh, so I'm simply making sure that that context is there um, and that there are no implications that, that there are people who are uninterested or unimaginative when it comes to exploring different ways of doing things, um, but that rather that was considered and was explored and for various reasons, which is on a case-by-case -case basis, whether we're looking at a OASIS project or something else, Sometimes when you weigh all the different factors and you engage in the conversation, you decide that this isn't, the, this isn't something that is realistically going to be successful, or if so, the cost and the uh, risks are uh, not acceptable for the community at large. And to suggest, uh, as I'm afraid sometimes it might be perceived, not necessarily by, intended by the speaker, but perceived by the listener, which is where my focus has been, uh, that that implication or inference not be there. Um, also, I sometimes when, when words are used like compensation being randomly assigned, um, I want to correct the record to make sure that there is no random assignment of, of compensation. Uh, it is done through a very purposeful and well thought out and in some instances well debated process. Uh, and, and that is what should be properly understood in context. And that is the only purpose for my having equally and likewise try to make sure that uh, uh, the takeaways are not different than what was intended. Um, I have nothing further with respect to uh, my statements tonight. I think everybody covered the other items that I might have mentioned. So with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Schell? Uh, here. Uh, yeah, here. Yes. yes, you are. I, I'm, I'm here and I'm voting it. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Commissioner Neustadt? Aye. Commissioner Wolbeck? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you and good night.